given that it's so important, what do you ask? What do you record? Uh, and how many speakers of a language will you try to interview? Well, uh, when we start working on a language, we kind of build from the very basics. Uh, we need to get uh, a basic vocabulary down so we can start getting a basic knowledge of language. So we start with simple words like body parts, uh, kin terms, color terms, numbers, uh, natural phenomena like water, sun, moon, things that every language is likely to have a term for. Uh, from there we build up slightly larger structures, so uh, for example with Koro, they have pigs, uh, so trying to find uh, something about noun phrase structure, we, we ask people a lot of things like, you know, how do you say the black pig, how do you say the big black pig, how do you say two pigs, two big black pigs, so we just get a little bit of uh, larger and larger structures, get some information from there, um, ultimately we try to collect stories and, um, you know, as much as we can. Mm -hmm. There's a balance between what uh, we need to collect to be systematic and thorough and what the speakers have patience to give us. So people get tired after a while of saying, uh, you know, two big black pigs. Um, on the other hand, if we record the language as it's used fluently and naturally, somebody telling a life story or something, then it's hard for us to understand. So there's a lot of, there's a trade-off between systematic data and natural data. Mm -hmm. You need to make your own Rosetta Stone. That's right. Exactly, and different people have different skills. So not only um, are certain things unbearable, certain things are enjoyable, and certain things are really uh, unpleasant for people. And it may be that one person is really good at listening to a story and telling you what it's about, but could never give you a story. And another person might be able to sit there and translate uh, phrases or sentences, and another person might find that to be just absolutely unbearable. So you have to kind of gauge individual speakers and that to answer the question about how many speakers you interview, it's really whoever is willing to, to sit down and work with you. Um, ideally as many as we can, representing as broad a spectrum of the community in terms of age, gender, location, this kind of different demographic features that which often contribute to language variation. Mm -hmm. The um Language hotspots, these are places of high diversity, high language endangerment, and relatively low documentation. Um, within a hotspot, where do you look? What are the things you're looking for to lead you to a language that may never have been documented before? Yeah, so a language hotspot is an area that has very high linguistic diversity, many languages and many different families of languages. It has high levels of language endangerment, so people are shifting over to speaking a dominant language and maybe the children aren't speaking it. And it has low levels of scientific documentation. Nobody's recorded it, nobody's written a grammar or a dictionary of the language. So within a hotspot, um, we would prioritize the languages that are smallest, that are most endangered, perhaps that are most unusual. And Koro really fits all of those. It is within a hotspot, and within that hotspot, it's one of the smallest languages, and it's an endangered language, and it's a completely undescribed language. So it's basically a hot language within a hotspot. Mm -hmm. And uh, that specific area we targeted within that specific hotspot because it was particularly unknown. There uh, were reports of half a dozen or so languages in the area which had uh, at most a couple of hundred words from them. Uh, maybe a few sentences and so we figured that was an area that we should concentrate on first because it was known to have a number of languages which were extremely poorly documented. As it turned out it had one more language which was undocumented. So you mentioned that when you first encountered the language it came as a complete surprise. You were working with someone to describe, to name body parts and I gather you expected to hear what you'd heard before from several other speakers of the language that you expected to hear and what you got was something completely different. So, was it, indeed, was it a complete surprise to encounter this language? Yeah, this, this was a surprise encounter. We went to India to visit um, this community that's shown here, the Akka people, and when we began talking to the Akka people, they said, there's another dialect of our language. If you go down to this other village, you'll hear the other dialect. So we went down to that village, we sat down with the speaker, and after hearing just a few words of the language, which turned out to be Koro, we realized that it wasn't a dialect, it was completely different in every possible way, and hadn't been really noticed. 
And locally, they downplayed the difference. They called it just a dialect, but in fact, it's very, very different. So at first, we just marked, there's another dialect spoken in X, Y, and Z village. Make sure we find someone who speaks this, like, this dialect, because yeah. we want to make sure we get as broad a spectrum of the variation there as we can. So, you know, we figured out, oh, you know, it's a dialect. We'll, we'll have some variation. They might say, ooh, instead of ah or something, and, you know, have a couple of different words, and, you know, it'll be neat to see what it is. But, you know, we finally met a speaker, I think, maybe two or three days later, and started talking to him and very instantly said, my God, this language is, I mean, it sounds so different from, from standard ACA that you don't even have to be a linguist to recognize that these languages were not the same. I mean, they just really sound quite different from each other. The, uh, in your book, The Last Speakers, I know this is, this is one of the stories that you relate, the story of, of discovering uh, Koro, the Koro language. But, but through the Enduring Voices Project, you've actually been traveling to a number of different parts of the world. What are some of the other places that you've visited uh, that, are, that are described in, in the book, The Last Speakers? And uh, are some of them, you know, I know there are hot spots in places you might not expect, places that don't seem nearly as remote as uh, uh, Arunachal Pradesh does to many of us here in the U.S. Yeah, so in the book, The Last Speakers, I talk about many of the expeditions that Greg and I have been on uh, to Siberia, to Bolivia, to Paraguay, uh, to Papua New Guinea. Uh, some places are well known, are in fact famous for having lots of languages like Papua New Guinea. Other places like Paraguay are really very poorly known, um, but they are also language hotspots. Of course, we have language hotspots uh, in our own backyards in here in the United States. Oklahoma is a, one of the hottest of hotspots, and that's something I think most people in the United States are unaware of. Even if they know the history of Oklahoma as Indian territory, they, they don't process the fact that, that, not unsurprisingly, there are a large number of remnant native languages still preserved in some form or another in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and um, really good language revitalization movements going mm -hmm. on there. So there is some hope for the Oklahoma language. Yeah, fantastic. And presumably many of those transplanted languages, when tribes were moved from, say, the eastern United States out west to Indian Territory, they brought their language with them, and it still managed to survive in, in form, some relic form. Cherokee language in Oklahoma would be an example of a transplanted language which mm -hmm. has managed to survive there. Um, the Koro language, um, you mentioned that it's so surprising that it has managed to survive within a tribe where another language is spoken. Treat it as a dialect, but it's not really a dialect. Um, could you speculate on why it has been able to survive? Uh, I know you're going to be doing further research to actually ascertain the reasons, reasons in more detail. And also, could you talk about some of the things that helped isolate and keep a language uh, living? One thing that helps languages to survive is physical geographic isolation. Uh, the Koro are isolated from the rest of the world, but they're s submerged within a more dominant group. And that's a very unlikely scenario for language survival. In fact, that's a recipe for <laughs> language endangerment. <laughs> what makes a language survive is the attitudes of its speakers. They value it, they keep it, they use it. And so it's a kind of mindset. It's, a, it's an ideology. Our language is valuable, we're going to keep it. Again, Koro is a very unlikely candidate. It's so small and it's so completely submerged within a more dominant ethnic group that it's really surprising and we're still surprised that it has managed to survive. It, because they are culturally subsumed in another group, it is only their linguistic practices, their language, their use of this language that identifies them as a different group. So perhaps that correlation of language so specifically with their identity uh, as a separate but similar group within the Aka tribe ha has uh, helped maintain the Koro language because it has a very strong association with being Koro and um, that has obviously kept the language around um, in the face of strong pressure to assimilate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because other than the Koro language they look the same, they dress the same, they live in the same houses, they do everything exactly the same as the more dominant Akka tribal group. So it is really the one thing that their distinct identity rests mm -hmm. upon. So almost every other aspect of their culture is shared. Exactly, mm -hmm. except for they happen to use different words for everything. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I know that in some communities, um, you put part of the goal of the Enduring Voices Project is to help to revitalize and certainly to th thoroughly document the languages. So th there's been a leave behind. You've left kits um, with people so that they can help to continue to document stories, parts of the language that you may not have had time to record uh, in, in your brief, relatively brief visits. Um, did you were you able to do that in this community? Yeah, so our job as scientists is to document the languages and to bring attention to them. Um, only the community that owns the language can save the language and ensure its survival. But we want to assist in that process. We want to help them revitalize their language. So we provide technology, uh, video and audio recording devices. Uh, we provide training to people who are what we call language activists, who are doing something active to save the language and we believe that we can assist as outsiders we can not only document we can help the community revitalize its language for the coro uh, we have actually in our next trip we'll be leaving some equipment with them uh, the kit has gotten more streamlined than we had in the last time we were there so now we have an appropriate set of material of equipment for them uh, which we didn't when we were last there, mm -hmm. so, so I think that uh, we'll have a better kit to leave with them this time. So, beyond the uh, the actual words used to describe various things, ideas, uh, and objects, um, what are some of the sorts of things we can learn from a, a unique, previously undocumented language? Well, every language presents a unique worldview. It presents all of the accumulated wisdom and the knowledge base that these people have kept over the centuries, over the millennia, that have allowed them to survive in this environment. We don't even really know everything that's there. It's, it's a, a huge knowledge base. Um, we've only just begun to appreciate what Koro represents. We've collected words and sentences, but we want to go, as we continue to the next level, what, is the, what are the knowledge systems contained in the language? We have a couple of hints about it as we're starting to get a better understanding about the grammar of the language and the, and the content of the vocabulary. Um, again, some, there, these mostly remain mysteries, but um, there are little tantalizing windows uh, of opportunity to expand our knowledge here, I think. And then finally, um, we, could you say a few words to me in Koro? Uh, okay. Um, Here's one. Ne nume gideyonye, which means I'm looking at you. <laughs> and kaplaye, uh, that means thank you. Kaplaye. Yeah. It's good, literally. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you're welcome, and, and thank you. Kaplaye. <laughs> <laughs> kaplaye. <laughs> <laughs>